My name is Richard Stout. I'm up here with Justin Braun and Chip Cunningham. And uh, we have had the great fortune to have completed a couple of cloud upgrade projects so far, and we have a couple more in the pipeline. Uh, so knowing that uh, Infor was going to give you a great presentation highlighting the value proposition of cloud, we thought uh, we'd follow that up with um, a little bit of, uh, you know, details, real-world uh, implementation experience. Um, so hopefully this answers all your questions about how cloud projects work, uh, what is the, you know, what does Lawson look like when it's running in the cloud, and how is that different from an on-premise deployment? Uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of give a, a high-level uh, picture of how Lawson in the cloud works and um, talk a little bit about getting there. Uh, we'll talk about um, customizations, because I know it's a big, uh, big interesting subject um, about, about what's available uh, for running Lawson in the cloud. Um, and feel free to stop me along the way. Just if you have questions, just shout them out or uh, raise your hand and um, we'll, we'll try to answer uh, everything we can. Um, we are RPI consultants. Um, I think Keith did a pretty good job introing us. We'll be here all day, so I don't have to talk too much about that. Uh, I want to get right into how the cloud works. How does Lawson work in the cloud? We know it is backed by Amazon Web Services, uh, you know, one of the best um, data center uh, systems available today. And what that really means is you're going to be running on the Microsoft stack. Uh, when you're in the cloud. So uh, Lawson in the cloud is running on Windows and running on SQL Server. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a, one of the, the key distinctions and uh, one of the most um, interesting parts of the cloud deployment project when moving from you know, a non-Microsoft uh, platform. Uh, so that's, for, for me, that's been one of the most... Can you ask how many people here on the Microsoft platform today are on Windows? Have Lawson on Windows? Nobody? Nobody? Awesome. Great. Then we have a lot of good content to talk about. This should be fresh and interesting. Wow. Everybody's Unix. That's amazing. Uh, so your, your loss in cloud environment is uh, basically a, a private extension of your network. Um, you're connected to it with a site-to-site -site VPN. Uh, nobody else can really get, get to it. Even Infor uh, doesn't really have a back door into your cloud. It's, it's secured. Um, you are able to make, um, you know, web interfaces available to the outside world if you choose. So if you're running ESS and you, you have that available for employees to log in from home, uh, you still have that option uh, with cloud. Uh, you basically have control over what traffic's allowed uh, over the internet, if any, and what traffic goes through your, uh, your VPN tunnel. And you still pretty much have the level of access you'd expect in terms of interfaces and file transfer and database query and, and what have you. Uh, so one thing that's a little bit different about cloud versus an on-premise upgrade is when you sign up for cloud, uh, they're able to provision a full set of components relatively quickly uh, because it's cloned from a template. So we have already a fully configured Lawson environment with all the various pieces configured to talk together, tuned to work well together. Um, so the, this, is a, this is a nice advantage over standing up Lawson 10 on-premise is the product doesn't really need to be installed. Uh, all that work and configuration has already been done. Uh, it just needs to be replicated for your environment. Uh, so what we see is with cloud projects, um, very early on in the project, we're able to access a fully functional environment. Um, just want to touch on the, the difference between cloud and, and cloud suite. Um, there's just various options available when you sign up for cloud. Uh, you can either do a la carte licensing, try to mirror the licensing you have for your on-premise deployment, uh, or you can take advantage of one of the industry-specific bundles. So, you know, for example, uh, there's a healthcare cloud suite bundle that comes with a, a lot of the products that are commonly used together uh, by healthcare customers. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about UpgradeX because 
Um, how many in the room are on Lawson 9 today? OK, like so the majority. Um, so uh, you know, a lot of the organizations that are thinking about moving to cloud are thinking about doing that as part of their Lawson 10 upgrade uh, and take advantage of the program Upgrade X. Cloud isn't just for customers on Lawson 9. Uh, we are doing a project right now, um, a move um, to the cloud for a customer that's already on loss in 10. I mean, the, the uh, value proposition is there for customers already running loss in 10 as well. But Upgrade X is a, is a program that uh, it's what we call is the triple play. Uh, it allows you to move to cloud-based deployment. It allows you to move from loss in 909 to uh, loss in 10. And it's a conversion of licenses from a, a traditional on-premise license where you're paying maintenance to um, a software as a service license where you're paying a subscription instead of maintenance. All right, so that's about cloud. What is a, what is a cloud project look like? What does it look like getting to the cloud? Um, which, is, which is where we come in in this equation. Uh, so at a high level, uh, cloud projects are production first projects. Uh, meaning all of the project activity happens into the future live environment. Uh, that's, and we have multiple passes, meaning the, the big part of the, of the cloud migration is taking the data from your on-premise system and transforming it and uploading it into the Amazon hosted servers. Um, the, 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 that's the, the big part, the big... Um, most visible piece, of course, is the application product line, right? The, the, the prod product line, all that data needs to move up to the cloud. Um, there's a lot of other pieces along with that, too. When you look at um, security and environment data, uh, you know, even things like a print manager files and, and job definitions, uh, all those pieces come together to make an upgrade pass. And uh, with our cloud projects, just like with our on-premise upgrades, uh, we look at doing multiple passes, uh, each one being uh, more refined, and, uh, and, and we look at the, uh, as we move through the project, each pass becomes faster and faster until we have a very accurate prediction uh, uh, down, to the, down to the minute of um, what's going to happen during Go Live weekend, uh, how long we expect each step in that process to take. Um, here's a sample uh, timeline. This is a timeline for upgrade, uh, upgrade X, meaning uh, move from loss in 9 to loss in 10, but I think it would be fairly similar if you were already on loss in 10. Would you care to talk through this a bit, or shall I? Yeah, please. Um, I mean, it, it, it's pretty standard uh, waterfall methodology that we, that we have here. It's uh, measure twice, cut once. So in, in a moment, we'll talk about your test plan. That's a big, a big piece of the puzzle uh, for us. Um, but, you know, during the first pass, we're, uh, as Richard said, we're running a stopwatch on each step to make sure that the lift and shift approach, that there's enough time in a downtime weekend to get all of your on-prem data from your servers up into the cloud transformed. If you're moving from Oracle to SQL, there's some steps involved in that, obviously the application upgrade. Um, and at the conclusion of the first pass, we'll turn the system over to the users for the first pass of testing. Um, which might be qualitative in nature, users logging in, uh, doing some application exploration, exploring the new version 10 functionality, um, getting familiar with the system for the first time. Uh, the second pass is uh, more refined. At that point, we're making very specific additions or subtractions to what will become your go-live cutover punch list or checklist. Um, again, we're running the timing to make sure that it's adequate. At the, sec at the conclusion of the second pass, we're going to turn the system over again, and that's when you would be engaged in like your user acceptance testing, more rigorous data validation, maybe some side-by-side -side payroll reports, things like that, to really get a comfort level. Um, if it is a, a three-pass approach, we refer to that second pass as kind of a go-live dress rehearsal or a mock go-live, as I saw in Jeff's slides. Um, you know, from there, uh, usually between user acceptance and go-live, we will move data into your test environment so that it's there prior to cutover. Um, we'll do a formal readiness assessment, which is starts with a good review and sign off of test plan results, uh, making sure all appropriate communications have occurred. 
and you know finally go live itself, which hopefully at that point is kind of a non-event. So it's probably not too different than an on-prem upgrade, uh, but that's essentially our methodology. Any any questions or feedback so far? I noticed a lot of hands are still on version nine. How many are actively moving to ten? Like how many folks are in the version ten upgrade right now? Uh, talk a, we'll talk a little bit about um, client project uh, staffing. What is the you know w w what are the what are the human resources uh, you should expect to bring um, to a uh, cloud migration project? Um, we have a you know a, a strong project manager is important. Um, holds everything together, uh, keeps everybody aligned and on task. Um, your Lawson administrator definitely plays a, a role in the in the cloud project and 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 post live uh, because you know there is still a, a uh, administration um, component to to cloud. Uh, it's just a it's just a little bit different ro type of role. Um, of course, Lawson uh, your Lawson administrator role is, is also important because you can't forget that the Lawson nine environment continues to need. Uh, uh, maintenance and administration throughout the duration of the uh, upgrade project. Uh, that's the same with on-premise too. Uh, just because you're focused on something new doesn't mean uh, the thing that's, that's live has gone away. Um, from your uh, IT group, I mean outside of your ERP administration team, um, look at getting your uh, networking group involved uh, since they do need to make sure you have uh, network connectivity um, mm -hmm. to the cloud, um, the, the cloud environment. Uh, desktop support, because when moving to Lawson 10, uh, <coughs> there's, a, there's a change in browser compatibility. And, uh, you know, we've seen there's just, there are uh, things at the, the desktop level uh, that, you, that you do want to look into and, and validate that the Various desktop configurations in your organization are, are going to offer good performance and good compatibility uh, with Lawson 10. Uh, and and that's, that's more of a 10 thing than a cloud thing, honestly. Uh, uh, security, there are, um, we'll talk a little bit uh, later if there's time about ADFS and uh, what's involved there. Uh, definitely a security component uh, from on your uh, enterprise networking side. Uh, and then, of course, Interface developers, report developers, uh, for uh, since everyone here is running Lawson backed by uh, Oracle or DB2, of course, when looking at a platform migration, everything that integrates with the database layer uh, is going to need a, a little uh, tender loving care to get it working um, as smoothly uh, using a different different vendor's database system. And then, of course, on the functional side. Um, you know, we, we have our uh, requirements definition. We have a, a broad level of testing, uh, usually a couple of different phases of testing. And that's the same with a, an on-premise upgrade as well. Uh, data validation, you know, if you're using Lawson for payroll, maybe parallel payrolls and uh, confirming that they match. Uh, and then, of course, end user training. Probably one un under the developer banner as well. Again, since we have a lot of Unix in the in the room, um, any organ if you have a shell script running on your Unix system today, that's something that is no matter what going to need to be remediated. And you've got some options there as you move to the Windows platform. Uh, bat scripting is one option. If it's a script that's doing any kind of integration, you've got SQL Server integration services, and then of course there's the info enabled extensibility tools like IPA. So. Assessing that decision and engaging those that developer, whether you have someone that can do bat scripting to replace the shell script, or um, uh, you know uh, uh, someone that knows SSIS to affect integrations in that way, it's it's sort of taking an inventory of what skills you have, and figuring out you know where you need to fill those gaps, whether within your team or from from your consulting partner, et cetera. So that would be one additional development that, that I would add to that list. You have anything to add, Chip? I, um, I just think that. Um especially with the customizations and, the, you know, moving scripting off. Of, you want to try and stay as true to Enforce tools as you can. Um, you know, you're going to go through a process to, uh, to get your customizations or whatever approved. It can, and sticking to the Infor IPA, the import tools like IPA and Design Studio and 
all the reporting functionality. That that's that, that's probably your best bet. Cool. You guys preempted my development slides. <laughs> uh, well, can I talk about the test plan? I would love if you talk about the test plan. Who loves testing? This is a user group. Come on. <laughs> Am I the only one? All right. Um, I do love testing. Uh, I've been working with Lost a long time, and I've been on a lot of projects. And you know, the projects where testing goes well, GoLab goes well, right? So we put a lot of focus on testing. Um, we believe in having a central consolidated test plan. It doesn't need to be this pretty, but if you engage Chris Gordon, it will. Thanks, Chris. Um, what is our test plan? A test plan is a lot of things, right? Like a test plan is a collection of scripts that you may or may not use. But if you're an organization that's been running Lawson for 10 years, like a lot of folks in this room, the scripts aren't, you know, aren't really necessary at this point. So what else is a test plan? I mean, a test plan is, when we talked about our methodology, we talked about the different passes and the different expected results of your first pass versus your second pass, and the test plan articulates that. You know, when we do our first pass, application exploration, we expect these outcomes. When we do our second pass, it's more rigorous, it's more involved. A test plan is, is periods of time. Uh, so the first pass test is occurring in these two weeks, th three months from now. And our second pass test, since we know it's gonna be a little more intense, we're gonna schedule six weeks for that because we have to share the folks that are doing that data validation with their day jobs. So a test plan is scheduling people at, at appropriate times to achieve outcomes. And a test plan is something like this to track all that and give everyone visibility into your percent complete. I mean, there's a lot going on in a project of this magnitude and scale, but at the end of the day, what percent complete are you on your testing and what's that based on is a really important question that everybody on the team should have an answer to. So if you create something that, that gives you that visibility, it's very powerful in the project. So we advocate for that. Um, from there, you might notice that our test plan has a little tab in Excel here. Um, we have a dashboard to keep track and say, okay, in the first pass, like what percent complete are we? How much has succeeded versus failed, et cetera? Um, so we have use cases, which are like the old scenarios, like entering a journal entry or running a payroll. Those are your classic application use cases. Reporting, what custom reports do you have? What side-by-side -side report comparisons? Your, your, your customizations or your mods and bods? You know, your process flows, interfaces, and any extensions you have. So you identify all those things and, and you, you, know, you start having conversations about what does your, what, what does your test plan need to look like? Um, Everybody knows all that stuff. What's unique about a test plan in a cloud deployment, right? Like based on our experience working with the cloud, um, one of the things that you really wanna pay extra attention to during testing um, and get the feedback from the, from the users is, is system performance. Um, you wanna make sure that you're focused on that, uh, particularly if you're in a, in a high transaction area like AP. Um, you wanna make sure that, the, that you're getting the system performance response time that you need. Um, that's not, often measured in a test plan, and we recommend that it does. Another thing that's important to have in place going into testing, and again, this isn't necessarily cloud specific, but um, you wanna make sure everybody on the team is aware of how to report an issue. What's the protocol for that? What's the, issue, what's the escalation path? Um, so all of those things tie into a test plan. A test plan's a lot more than just a collection of scripts. Um, and we think it's something that you, know, that you should hammer out in planning, because a lot of your project activities will depend on what your test plan is, when your users are, when your key stakeholders are available to participate. You know, if you have a fiscal year end in June, probably not gonna get a lot of, you probably wouldn't wanna schedule your user acceptance testing in, you know, July, right? So those types of things come up. Um, so that's my spiel on test plan. Any questions about that or anyone looking for any advice or, yeah. How would, if someone um, would migrate to the cloud and they have, say, automated testing, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that because I haven't worked with automated testing tools. Um, yeah, I generally they there's not a server side component to that, um, so you you know it should behave the same way. If it's if the server's in the cloud versus on premise. Even if there were a need for a server side component, we could look at 
doing that for business purpose. We have to run through some folks at Amcor or cloud operations, but there's, there are times when we would accommodate things like that. All right. So what can we do to prepare for the cloud? If you're considering moving to the cloud, if you're beginning, just beginning a cloud project, uh, what are some things we can do to help, help launch into the cloud? Um, I guess one of the most important things is, is really to know and understand uh, the loss in environment that you have in place today uh, so we can make sure every single functionality maps uh, to an equivalent functionality in the cloud. Uh, so diagram out what the environment you have today looks like and all of the pieces that connect to it. Understand what platforms each of those pieces are running on, what technologies they use. Uh, so we can, we can help map each of those things to the equivalent uh, technology or platform over on the, the Amazon uh, Microsoft stack. Uh, and then inventory, all of uh, you know, the, the mods and bods, uh, that's reports, interfaces, customizations, uh, extensions, um, you know, everything that we know isn't gonna be present on a fresh install of, uh, of Lawson 10 in the cloud, um, that we wanna configure that system uh, to have all that capability. And desktop review. Uh, this is, uh, again, I think for, for anyone moving to loss in 10, um, you know, we, we found this is, this is a pretty important piece of the project. Um, Mingle is fairly graphics intensive where Portal was not. Uh, so, you know, there's, of course, there's a variety of desktop uh, configurations um, available. Uh, to your end users, um, including maybe virtual desktops. Uh, just be sure to uh, test, test the types of transactions that those users are gonna do using their systems. And uh, as Justin mentioned before, when it comes to uh, data entry uh, type roles, uh, those, those are roles that are definitely more sensitive uh, to a, a very slight change in, um, in uh, user interface behavior or performance. You know, even something like a tab order uh, is, is gonna be um, a greater impact on data entry uh, groups rather than the occasional loss in user. Um, take a look at the size of your database. Uh, of course, when you're, when you're moving to the cloud, um, you know, that entails converting that application database from DB, uh, DB2 or Oracle into SQL Server and uh, uploading the full set of data uh, from your on-premise servers up to the cloud. Um, all that is, um, the amount of time that that takes is, is, is almost linear uh, based on the number of gigabytes in your, data, in your database. Uh, so take a look at what your application database is, um, particularly uh, the, the size of the data, even minus the indexes, because it's not necessary, not, it may not be necessary uh, to copy indexes up to the cloud. Really, we need the application data. Uh, and if you have a large data set, you know, it's a, that's a great time to start thinking about uh, archiving or purging some data uh, to, to improve the overall timeliness uh, of the upgrade and reduce the downtime required. Anybody have questions on archiving? No, we're all good. Yeah? How are you measuring your database as far as um, data file in gigabytes, number mm -hmm. of records, or? Yeah, I would say just like overall, like this, like gigab gigabytes, number of gigabytes that the application data takes minus the indexes. That's, yep. that's I think, right? That's the metric we use, right? We, we start there, um, and if it's, if it's large, if it's you know 600 gigabytes, um, we might drill into that and get like a table count, record count report out of your database okay. and do some analysis and say, oh, gee, you know, the usual suspects, GL trans, PR time, they come right to the top, and you you know, you can analyze it in that way. And and, and I didn't mention it during testing. I'm sorry to go back, but that's part of the the handover on the, the upgrade cycle that you should make sure you're getting, whether you're doing the migration yourself or with a partner. You really want to see table count, record count 
before and after for that migration. It, you don't want to start testing without it. You know, I, I skipped right over it because it's like a foregone conclusion that that would be provided. I'm just giving you all the heads up, ask for that. You know, when, when your migration's complete, make sure you're getting the, the target and source table count record count so you know you, that everything you started with made it across, especially in a database migration because things can get, can get lost if you don't have all the tooling right. Okay, what else can we do to prepare? Um, definitely get your IT group uh, engaged in this project early uh, because there are some things that they need to do uh, right in the early stages of the project, uh, mainly the site-to-site -site VPN. Uh, that needs to be set up uh, fairly early on uh, in the project so we can have um, direct access to the cloud environment. Um, uh, ADFS set up, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later, um, um, that the way that single sign-on is done with loss in the cloud is, uh, even if you're going to single sign-on against your Active Directory, uh, that's done with ADFS rather than LDAP bind. Um, so that's something that needs to be set up by your, uh, your enterprise networking team. Uh, and there might be some uh, user group setup needed uh, on the Active Directory side. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about customs because um, this is uh, hopefully a, a pretty exciting and interesting topic. No? <laughs> um, so customization in the cloud, um, you know, the, 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 the model, the uh, value proposition, um, it, it works best when maintenance is more streamlined and um, to, to do that, I'll just to do that, we'll, um, we'll move customizations to configurations, which means it makes it easier to update the application uh, and maintain all of the things that, uh, about that application that are uniquely configured for your business processes, um, rather than having your uh, customer-specific business logic uh, intermingled with, uh, you know, with loss and standard code. So I'll talk about different kinds of customizations and how they fit into a cloud environment. And first, let's talk about all the things in the, uh, <laughs> it's a little mood lighting. <laughs> <laughs> things are getting interesting. <laughs> um, in for cloud. So let's talk about all the things that, that we all consider a customization, but, but which Infor does not. Uh, all, all of these pieces here are, are what's now known as configuration uh, in, uh, it, you know, in, with the future of Lawson. Um, these, are, these are areas of the application that you're free to develop in and are uh, relatively safe from uh, application or, or environment updates uh, because they are, uh, you know, uh, th this, this is a method of uh, modifying the way Lawson works that's supported by a, a, the software vendor. I mean, Infor designed the system to be configurable uh, with this tool set. And, you know, I mean, as you guys know, I am a huge fan of IPA. So that's definitely the thing that's at the top of my list. So there's so much that we can do with IPA. Uh, but you do have available, you know, Design Studio for uh, you interface changes to the S3 web applications. Uh, you've got configuration console over on the landmark side. So for uh, not just contract management and uh, global HR, but even the IPA, uh, you know, workflow engine itself, the web in basket, all of that can be uh, modified with configuration console. You've got lots of customization capabilities with smart office. Uh, all of your security uh, is not considered a customization. Uh, and then uh, everything that you can do with LBI, uh, all that's available. Uh, so these, these are the tools that uh, are, are um, these are the best tools to use uh, when looking at personalizing your, your loss in system. Let's take a look at some other pieces that are become a little bit more difficult to maintain uh, for GL, uh, custom tables uh, and, and scripts. These are things that are a little bit harder to maintain through updates. And then 
um, some of the more what we think of as invasive customizations, um, particularly like ESS modifications, RQC modifications, as you know, those get wiped out every time you deploy a new version of that self-service application. Um, so we, we look at minimizing those types of customizations uh, when, when moving to an environment that's more uh, streamlined for maintenance. And I, I'm not sure, but your question about the automated testing, any, any code requiring elevated permissions or cloud services, I remember reading it. There's, a, there's another third party partner that has a security product that bolts onto Lawson, and that would fall under that category of a, of a non-Lawson system that needs special access to the database. So those are also in this highly discouraged. Um, and it's not to say they can't be approved, these highly discouraged, I think tier one customizations they're called, or tier twos. Um, they do require senior VP approval uh, from someone at N4. I just, I just want to say that that's why it's important up front to, to fill out your RICE documentation so that we can go through those customizations and help you figure out a solution that, that kind of best fits in the cloud for uh, Yeah, so that your, your cloud objective is to transition customizations into configurations. Richard, I have a quick question going uh, back to um, EMSS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We use Intellius mm -hmm. for um, open enrollment for EMS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, they, they take a copy of XPNNet and make it their own version. How does that work in the cloud? Is that still doable within a particular Um Well, that's a modification to, to delivered ESS files, basically. Um, so yeah, they, they, they put their mods within mm -hmm. EMS code, yeah. but it's in a different directory, and then all their, their configuration reads off of that, that particular directory instead of the original. Oh, OK. Um, I guess, I don't know. I guess I'd, I'd look Did to Infor for, for a clarification on that. Or anything like that. Um, so IntelliX <laughs> generally supports that. So we, we've done, um, you know, we've done work with systems that have uh, have IntelliS software installed, yeah. but they generally come in and, and handle it yeah. as part of their support. Yeah, as, as you know, every time we apply an EMS update, yeah, you know that delivers a new version of XBN Net that whole directory structure, and then IntelliS has to retrofit all that stuff again with their their, their new their new code. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you guys so want to actually clarify that? We have, yeah. a, we have a client coming up who has uh, Intellius, and uh, they, they've already been approved to yeah. put it in the cloud, so okay. it's, it's still okay. okay. I'm just curious how, yeah. how that would work in a, in a cloud scenario. Yeah. Yep. So, um, we can tell you more in a few months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can, I can only pass on... The, the guidance that we've been given and, and the experience that we've had, I, I can't speak for in policy. So okay. uh, I want to be careful about saying yes or no on that. But uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so with moving to the cloud from a, you know, if you're not already on the Windows platform, uh, that does present some interesting challenges. And you got to, um, Take a look at some of the some of the pieces about your lost environment that are specific to the platform it's running on, and look at transitioning those pieces or to um, equivalent technologies or functionality over on the Microsoft side. So things like shell scripts, uh, anything that's referencing uh, Unix file paths is going to need to uh, change um, to you know the equivalent uh, file paths on on the Windows side. And with, with scripts, we generally look at taking shell scripts and uh, using that as an opportunity to um, bring that functionality in, into IPA. Uh, IPA is a, really a wonderful workflow product. Uh, it has a, there's a lot that you can do with it, and, and I'd say it offers a better, uh, better overall solution for automation than, um, than set scheduled scripts on, running on the server. You have a lot more visibility of what's going on um, with IPA. Um, anything at the database layer uh, obviously needs to get moved over to um, SQL Server. And uh, if I didn't mention before, um, you are allowed to 
create uh, objects in the database uh, so views or stored procedures are, are okay. They just need to be written um, you know, in, in T-SQL for, for Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, and then there's a change, uh, there's, there's some change with IDs uh, moving uh, from Unix to uh, Windows. So um, some of you have maybe, uh, have maybe seen this where, uh, where uh, parts of Lawson that, that, pre that on Unix um, use a username uh, over on Windows, there's an NT ID, uh, which is sort of a, uh, a code that gets mapped back to username. And there is a tool available in Lawson uh, to do that, to, you know, to show that conversion. So we look at integrating that tool uh, into anywhere that we, we want to show a username like you would normally see on the Unix side. Um, yeah, so we look at what's, what's different about cloud um, from a perspective of um, custom development. Um, so on the database side, yeah, you do have access to put things in the database. Uh, so if you have, you know, complex reports that take advantage of a view, um, you know, you, you can maintain that um, store procedures as well. Um, on the, you know, with Windows, um, you know, those of us that are, are Windows administrators, we're, we, we've gotten used to doing everything by remote desktoping into the machine uh, and working at the console. Um, you know, when, when your system is hosted by someone else, I think that's, that's just a fair part of the contract is in order for them to, to guarantee uptime, uh, they, they want to maintain administrative control of the system. So with, uh, you know, cloud deployments, you won't be uh, remote desktoping directly into the LSF server. Uh, you'll be doing administration on the LSF side through LID. Um, and you, you will, your, the processes that you can start uh, on the LSF server run with a non-privileged account or a non-administrative account. Um, so that it's just a different mindset, uh, especially for those that are used to Windows administration um, that, you know, generally have full control full access to everything at their fingertips. Uh, there is a, a great level of, um, you know, uh, security control available uh, within the Windows operating system, which is not often taken advantage of. Uh, and here with the cloud uh, deployments, we do take advantage of that to make sure that user processes are run with non-privileged accounts. All right, so what's different about uh, what's different about Lawson when it runs in the cloud? Um, single sign-on, and I would love Chip it to uh, explain this a little bit more <laughs> in detail, uh, but at a high level um, where an on-premise Lawson environment does an LDAP bind to do password validation against Active Directory. Um, in, with cloud, we use a different technology, ADFS, Active Directory Federation Services. Yeah, so uh, Active Directory Federation Services is basically a, it's a Windows offering that uh, Lawson takes advantage of that allows Active Directories to kind of talk back and forth. So you have a, an Active Directory instance, ADFS instance in the cloud, you have an ADF ins instance down on premise, and um, when you authenticate, it goes, and those two talk back and forth, and there's a token that's exchanged between the two. And basically, it authenticates your password against your Active Directory through that ADFS connection. Um, and uh, what the users see different, one of the, one of the main things the users uh, see different in this scenario is they are gonna log on with their full domain rather than just, uh, just a username. Uh, and that's just that's that's just a, a function of ADFS. Is uh, is with ADFS you'd log on with your full username at domain name. Um, user account provisioning. Um, some differences there uh, versus a, an, an on-premise deployment. Um, first off, um, Enforce Security Services becomes the the main user interface uh, for account maintenance um, with, with cloud deployments. Um, that's actually uh, not, so, not so much a, a unique characteristic of cloud, but of, of a federated loss in 10 environment. So um, 
for those of you on Lawson 9 with process flow, uh, looking to go to Lawson 10, build out Landmark and IPA, um, you know, one of the pieces that tie, the, 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 the piece that ties those two application servers together from a security standpoint uh, is ISS and for security services. Uh, and when you switch to ISS, the, um, the ISS website becomes the place that you go rather than the Lawson Security Administrator desktop client uh, to create users, to change user role assignments, change properties of a user like an email address. Um, so, uh, you know, I've got in the background a screenshot of ISS if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it is, in, to, to me, it seems a lot friendlier um, than using Lawson Security Administrator. So I, I think of that as, a, as an upgrade. Um, and in the cloud, um, just like on-premise, uh, self-service users don't need a local account on the LSF server, but anyone that's going to run a batch job does. Uh, so in the cloud, uh, you still need an operating system user for anybody that's going to run jobs. Um, the, the way that those are provisioned is through uh, Enforce. So you would just open a ticket to maintain operating system users on the LSF server. All right. And this is my uh, final slide. And then we'll open it up to some Q&A since... So you've all been holding all your great questions for the end. <laughs> um, updates, this is, I, I think, you know, this, this is one of the, the value propositions of moving to the cloud. Uh, it's basically, you, it comes with uh, managed services, right? So any updates that you'd like to the Lawson system. Um, I, this is a nice differentiator, I think, for Lawson SaaS offering uh, versus a more, uh, you know, so, some of the other, uh, you know, SaaS products out there. Uh, when you think of software as a service, um, you think of your system basically evolving and updating rapidly. And as a customer, you're not really engaged in that decision-making process. With Lawson, um, you know, with Lawson in the cloud, with, Law with Lawson software as a service offering, uh, you as the customer get to decide when your system's going to be updated uh, and if you'd like to move forward to a newer version or not. Uh, so you have a bit of control over that. Um, all the updates are performed by Enforce Services. Uh, you just basically make a request and, um, and work with Enforce Services to execute those updates. Minor patches are, uh, you just have them applied and test first, do your testing, and then uh, work with IS to schedule a production downtime uh, to have those patches installed. Major releases come in sets. Uh, so this is a little bit different than on-premise because um, Infor uh, does invest the time and research into um, making sure that uh, set version sets across their various products uh, work well together and, and are configured well together and optimized for uh, the cloud environments. So uh, rather than just getting an ESP or an MSP, uh, whenever you do a major version update, um, you're, uh, the, all of the pieces, all the interdependencies are going to come together. So, for example, if you are looking at doing an environment update to your on-premise LSF server, uh, that might necessitate updating ISS or doing a landmark CU, uh, right? Because all of these technologies are, are interconnected and have version dependencies. Uh, so. Yeah, Infor has basically done all that research for you and put together uh, sets of versioning that come uh, deployed all as a package. Uh, so if you're going to do a major, up, if you're going to request a, a major version update to your cloud system, uh, that's going to come with a, a full set of updates across the board. Uh, so Infor knows all those products are tuned well together uh, rather than just applying uh, you know, applying an update to one piece and leaving the others behind. And it, it's, a, it's an indication of where the cloud cycle is, right? It's set one, just came out in February. Um, before that was set zero, right? So, <laughs> so they're, they're, they're starting to come out. We expect they'll come out about every six to nine months. And that's another thing that you'd want to kind of bake into your planning schedule for a project like this. You know, if you can sort of plan to take 
a set two or a set three right before, say, your user acceptance testing, that would be the least disruptive way to do it so that you're able to come live on the latest and greatest. Um, it's a little bit of a balancing act, but the information we have, it looks like every six to nine months, one of these, you know, bundled, pre-certified family of updates will be made available to you. Um, and by the time they do come out, they're oftentimes, you know, updating something that, uh, that really needs to be updated at that point. You know, we, uh, for example, ISS is, is one, of the, one of the components of the overall system that, that you can't a la carte update independently. So if your project encounters a need to update ISS, you, you may be forced to take that set update. So it's always a good idea to try to plan your windows and your project gates to allow for the latest and greatest set update throughout the course of the timeline, if that makes sense. Because the, that's a, something that's unique in the cloud is you can't pick and choose and say, oh, we just want to update ISS standalone. It's with the set update, you're going to update ISS and you're going to update all these other environment components and all these applications. So it, it's, a full, it's a full update. Um, so it's good to plan for that. All right. So with that, we'll open it up to questions. And... They don't have to be questions about cloud. <laughs> ask, I have a question, though. I mean, who's ask who's, me anything? Who's considering cloud? Who, who's thinking about? Okay. No. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Justin. Hey, Bill. Uh, Justin, you made a comment, you know, uh, in one of the, I mean, S3 is, is, is old, right? It's been around forever, and I'm, I'm excited to kill it, uh, but, but it's going to be here for a few more years. Um, as, long as, as long as it's around, I, I do find people are kind of get addled into this. Well, people know what to, what to test. I, I heard your comment. I, I, I know you don't really mean it. You know, people know what to test. I, regardless of how they do their testing, I don't... I'm very un un uncomfortable with test with having my customers test. I would test it. We're good. I want to see the paperwork. Right. I want to see what did you test. Where did you write down what you tested? And, and yes. You present that back to me so I can sign off on going to upgrade. Uh, if you guys take these cloud up upgrades, I mean, you're you're putting your, I mean, you're in the same position I am. You're putting your name on the line to make sure this is this is going well. I just can you speak to how you guys make sure? Absolutely. That if your clients, I'm sure, you know, it's great if you can. I signed off if you tested. That's great, but if the thing just goes in the toilet, that, that really doesn't help your name to be sullied. So, yeah. I need your perspective on, on how you make sure your clients are doing the right amount of testing and how you help them do that. That's exactly right. It's it's about. Um, one of the key project risks we always address right up front is end user engagement because there, there, there may be things about the way your users are using Lawson that aren't inherently obvious except to those users. So you need to engage them in the process. We, my comment was less about the value of the test plan, which I think is in, immensely valuable for that sign off that you mentioned. My comment was more about the specific go to GL40, enter your company, click inquire, like that old school script that gives you a play-by-play -play of exactly how to do it. I, to test the, you know, the full awesome system, I mean, if you have the resources to approach it in that way and create that level of audit trail, that's wonderful. I mean, that's the perfect case. We work with a lot of organizations that don't have that amount of resource to bring to bear. So what we do instead is we identify for each functional team a leadership role that is ultimately accountable for that functional area. They typically divide along, you know, financials, accounts payable, payroll, HR, the normal supply chain, the normal application areas. We, again, end user engagement early in the process is very important in a lot of respects, but primarily that user acceptance testing sign off needs to be based on something. And that's what the test plan gives you, is it gives you a listing of several hundred use case scenarios organized by module or organized by functional area. And that test plan is broadcast the entire project team. And each of those functional owners are responsible to effectively sign off and say, yeah, you know, it's impossible for the PMO to, to see and touch a screen print for every single thing that, that a user could do in the system. So there is that, that handoff of trust. And the way to sort of audit it, police it, monitor it, and control it 
is through that test plan, asking for that sign-off to actually mean something. Um, and it's part of our readiness assessment, so that when we prepare to go live, you know, we like to go around the room and make sure that we're looking, you know, right in, and, and you know who the usual suspects are, right? Like, did you run a payroll parallel? Did you tick and tie? Did you calculate BSI taxes? You know, the, how's your trial balance looking? You know, you know, you know what they are, and, and that's the point is, at some point, there's that trust handoff to the functional owners. And if they're, you know, if they're not there at the beginning of the project, then again, that end user engagement early on is let's, let's partner up and figure out how we can get you there by the end. Uh, because it's, I say this all the time, that Lawson's a journey, it's not a destination. And you know, hopefully you already have a wonderful test plan from your last upgrade. But if you don't, we're gonna make sure you have one from this upgrade, right? So, so if, if I can add, because this is actually it's a great question, and it's one we have internally a lot at RPI. Um, just so nice to say that RPI is a delivery based organization in charge of delivery, so that makes a lot of sense for them, right? I end up supporting a lot of the sales. And the reality is there's an ideal case um, for all these projects and how they work, but there's constraints of time and money. And so uh, you know, when you look at uh, when you look at what tends to be our role in testing, it tends to be as an advisor, right? That tends to be an area where you don't want to pay consulting rates for someone to, to have a large footprint. Maybe some are good addition to it, but some, some don't, can't afford that. And we do a lot of the stuff that is, um, is that's hard for innovation to The database conversions, the migrations, the installation, the stuff that we're repeating. So, you know, I think that uh, Justin's usually the one coming up with those, with those questions, and I'm on the other side going, you know, but the business owner has to go get budget approved for this, right? And, you know, if we make this a half million dollar project, it's very difficult for that to happen. So I just, the realities are always a little bit more nuanced than yes, there's an ideal case scenario. And most of our customers have been through, um, have been through upgrade cycles and have very, very different, you know, from very detailed test scripts to very high level. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a challenge for us, right? Because our name's associated with it. It is a customer responsibility typically. And it's, it's hard for us to always be able to affect the quality of that outcome. That, that's an inherent challenge, I think, for professional services companies. We're, we're enablers. We cannot force customers to do anything. So, sorry. No. Right. That's what Justin wants. So that, that's an inherent challenge yeah, I think in every product. But we're going to be in conflict because you know maybe the, the Mercedes way to do it is is the is right. one million dollar project, and maybe we have to do the, the six hundred k project. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the question. Yeah. What are you seeing in your downtime progression between Pass One and Pass Three? How much shorter the time do you see? Yeah, um, I mean, Chip, you probably know better than anybody, um, but I mean, I... I guess the kind of the way I answer that is the first pass is always like, you know, what are, what are we going to do? I mean, we have an idea of what we're going to do, but it's like you have to work through certain things. Um, you got to figure out, you know, how long it's going to take. You know, you have, you have issues that you have to work through with database conversion. You have issues you have to work through with customers. With programs and stuff, but um, I mean, we usually go, you know, we usually cut down on time a lot. I mean, for, I think we were talking about for 135 gig database, we're maybe 8 to 12 hours of downtime. Of upload time. And, yeah, the third pass. <laughs> and then the first pass could be, you know, <laughs> sorry, the first, the, yeah. the first pass could be, you know, quite a bit longer because you're trying to figure mm -hmm. out what you're doing. It's also, how do you measure that, right? Like we might, the first pass might be a, a process with, you know, 100 steps, right? And it takes us maybe a week to do those 100 steps. But if you start and stop the stopwatch on each of those steps as if it was go live weekend, it might be 14 hours, right? And then we develop some tooling that we put in in the second pass, which takes four days, but really the system's only churning for like 24 hours. And, you know, so it's, Depends how you measure it, and that's 
we start the first pass with the go live punch list, right? And then we're adding and subtracting and fine tuning it as we go so that you have that. You know, on the project lead time, it took a week or two, but in the actual system time, it took, you know. So there's a couple ways to ask that question. And, and there is a database conversion, which obviously great complexity. We, we recommend four passes. I know we talked about three earlier for cloud, but that assumes you're not also migrating databases. And our, our goal is to get that third pass obviously down as low as possible. So we usually utilize the first pass to create tools to make it faster. So. Right. Your application database is probably pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a terabit or something? Well done, I'd say. Well done. So. We don't believe anything, so I got over 20 years of data. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> our archiving might be a good consideration for it. Yeah. I mean, any, anything over a terabit, that's that's a big front and center process. Let's talk about how we're going to archive some of that. No wonder. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. So, yes, I believe it is allowed because we're aware of some cloud clients that have a huge number of ODBC reports that if they were going directly against the application database would really slow down your production system. So they have a mirror copy of their database to support reporting. And some of you might have that same setup on-prem where you have a, a carbon copy of your production database that you use for ODBC reporting. So I think that's one way to answer it, but you seem to be asking Slightly different question. Well, I have 60 to 80 custom tables. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to address that business on the cloud. So if yeah. I can have a copy of the database and repopulate the data, that's one thing. Uh, if I can't do that, does Lawson or Infor allow database links directly to the database? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you'll, have, you'll have direct query access. Uh, to your production SQL server. And custom tables are, um, I would, uh, there's an approval process, right, that, that that goes through as part of the cloud implementation. Um, obviously, if you've used the case and 4GL tool set to extend the N4 application to build out some functionality that doesn't already exist in, in Lawson uh, with custom screens and custom tables and and business logic in, in between there, um, you know, there's there's a reason you've done that, and there's a need for that that plays a part uh, of your application. It uh, plays a part of the services the application provides to your organization. Uh, I think Infor would like to to maintain serving that functionality uh, with their solution in the cloud. If if the they'll work with you to find a, find the right solution for that. If it's something that can be done with standard loss and functionality, um, they'll recommend that. And there, you know, there is some new capabilities in, in loss and ten that perhaps some of those customizations overlap with. But if not, if it really is a, a unique, um, unique thing that that maybe isn't needed by other customers, you know, isn't part of the loss and standard functionality. Um, they'll let you bring those the, those tables and 4GL code into the cloud environment. One, one concept I have is to take my customization and move it in house away from the loss of time. To be able to do that, I have to add this link to the needed data. Oh, yeah. yeah then, yeah, you can totally do that. Yeah. Break that apart. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can yeah. even have a, an on premise data warehouse you know, that gets refreshed from. From production well, data. That's all, that's all right. If they want to stay in the cloud, yes, there is a way that we can accommodate those and you have access to the data. Yeah. So, like, the future of, of loss and on the landmark platform, um, you know, there's, there's capabilities to do all that native in, in landmark through configuration console. It's because that's a more modern technology. It's just, you know, with 4GL, you don't have that easy separation between 
um, the vendor delivered code and your and your custom code. It, it pretty much lives side by side. But you know, looking at moving to global HR or contract management um, on the landmark platform, you have the ability to create tables, uh, your own business classes, your own screens, and all that lives at a higher level to configuration layer. Um, so that, that's sort of the direction of where it's going. Do you, would they allow database triggers in the cloud? Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about, how about database views? Yeah, yes. definitely views are allowed. Yep. Yeah. All right. 